Good evening. Welcome to the Asia Society, and thanks for coming out on a, a rainy Monday right after uh, Thanksgiving. And um, I have rushed here right from Newark Airport so that I could be here because I'm really excited about this book and about this um, event. And really uh, glad to have all of you here. As you probably know, we have um, an ongoing relationship not only with uh, Eric, but with the Filipino-American creative, uh, I don't want to say bombshell, but that didn't sound good. <laughs> then I thought about a hurricane, that didn't sound good. Um, but there's an incredible amount of energy in the, in the creative uh, Filipino-American community here in New York City. So it's been um, an incredible delight to be a, a small part of helping to bring it to audiences. And, uh, and tonight is, is no different. Um, having Eric Camalinda's new book here, um, Descartes Highlands, which will thrill you, uh, freak you out, um, entice you, and uh, disturb you, and all the good things you want from books, right? Um, this book really has it. It's, it's a, a very interesting um, and gripping tale, which um, you'll get a, a little taste of tonight. Um, and I'm particularly thrilled that our old friend Jessica Hagedorn, who is not old, by the way, um, is here with us tonight. See, I get punchy when I get off an airplane. What can I say? <laughs> I'm with you. Um, all of us who are young in spirit are very excited to be here. and. Um, and Jessica's done many things on our stages, um, you know. So we're we're thrilled that they will be in conversation. And um, Eric's wonderful idea of having actors enliven and animate the the literary work is also um, a really special treat. I want to thank uh, Akashic Books uh, uh, and Katie Martinez and her colleagues. Uh, we have been doing what has turned out to be a series with Akashic, and it's. It's been great. Um, last year we did Manila Noir. Yay. Um, and then just a few weeks ago we did Tehran Noir. We're in a kind of noir moment. And, uh, and then tonight, so we're, we're thrilled. Uh, I hope that you will um, explore the Asia Society. In addition to doing Filipino American programs, we do other programs as well, um, including programs that are in our museum, uh, policy programs, business programs, really Asia uh, across the board. And that's one of the things I think is so unusual about this space uh, and the Asia Society, because it's understanding Asia from a three-dimensional standpoint. And, and the idea that um, the kind of differentiated and, and uh, unique aspects of of each artist or, or thinker can really come to the fore and you get a kind of comparative understanding of, of both a place, a person, and a region. And so that makes it a really exciting place to, to be around. Um, so I hope you'll hang out. And uh, see the Nanjum Paik exhibition, Becoming Robot, which is downstairs. See the store, which is also downstairs. And you'll see that there are uh, many programs. And often when we don't have a chance, if you're not in the city or you have friends that are elsewhere, we are live webcasting, live streaming most of our programs here because we want to make them available and we want to bring people into the conversation. So um, if you see something that's interesting and, and whoever you're thinking about isn't here in the city or it's you yourself, you can often join in, and, and usually we'll try to put something up as well. Um, 
Just moving ahead, I want to mention that on uh, December 15th, we're going to have Elizabeth Pisani here talking about her new book, uh, Indonesia, Etc., uh, which is a kind of look at Indonesia today uh, from a, an interesting journalist. And she'll be um, here uh, talking about the new book, so I hope you can join us. Um, so now we want to get started, though. And I think you all have bios in the materials, so I won't go into all of that, except to say that the, the format will be, um, Eric will come and, and give a kind of overview so that you have an idea, a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going. Um, we'll have a, a dramatic reading and then, and then a conversation, and we'll invite all of you. And then we would love to have you um, hang out, talk to the authors, and uh, pick up a book if you're so inclined. Um, so on that note, I'd like to ask Eric Amalinda to come up and uh, please give him a warm hand. Hey, uh, thanks for coming. So I've always wanted a different kind of book launch. So what we're gonna do tonight is uh, I've, I've invited a bunch of amazing actor friends to enact some scenes from the book. Uh, so basically, the, the story is about two men living in different parts of the world who share some kind of dark secret. Um, they don't know each other, but they do know that they were sold for adoption by their American father sometime in 1972, um, right when uh, Ferdinand Marcos was about to declare martial law in the Philippines. Uh, and I think you'll get a, a taste of the, the story uh, once we get into the reading. So why don't we start doing that? And just like the book, there will be very little author intrusion. Um, I'll be here to just introduce some of the es some, some of the scenes. Uh, this first excerpt is uh, a bunch of different scenes from the book. Uh, it's a series of excerpts uh, from the story of the second son, whose name is Matthew, uh, who grew up in France. Uh, here we look at his nascent relationship with his Thai girlfriend, Janya. Matthew has just revealed to Janya a discovery he had made shortly after his parents' death that he was adopted to replace their two-year-old son who was lost at sea in the Philippines. Lenapool is a weird town, one of those intermediate places that people don't really stop for, overshadowed by its larger, grander cousin, Can. Its anonymity has always appealed to me and I never saw any reason to give up my parents' apartment. Janya's uh, been looking at a bunch of souvenirs. One of them is a clay figurine of a little boy, a little imp poised to take a leak, its little hand wrapped around its penis. Beside it is a replica of a grinning gargoyle, an elongated tongue sticking out of its wide mouth. Both were designed by the late eccentric American millionaire Henry Clues, whose outlandish chateau by the shore is probably the town's most prominent attraction. Don't tell me you're gonna get that. The peeing boy or the gargoyle? Doesn't matter, they're equally disgusting. Aw, I think the boy's pretty cute. He reminds me of the boy in your films. Kind of looks like him too. All little boys look the same. So what's your story? I've told you a lot of things nobody else in the world would ever know. What dark, delicious secret will you share with me? Nothing. Not fair. <laughs> Compared to yours, my life story is really dull. I am almost ashamed to even talk about it. Try. Okay, I have eight brothers and 12 uncles, and I've always wanted to be a boy. Hmm, interesting. Uh, I'm not a lesbian. Okay, just a passing thought. <laughs> You're my first real relationship. Hmm, and the others were, what, unreal? False starts. Uh, later, Janya decides to go back to the street market to purchase a statue of the little boy for Matthew, who remains in the apartment. It is at this point that his seizures begin again, an affliction he has never told Janya. Janya finds him sprawled on the floor. Something's happened. Someone's spoken to me. Who? 
Matthew. The lost boy? The same fucking one. Was that what the vertigo was all about? What vertigo? Bangkok, my apartment, my Thai? No. I don't know. This hasn't happened in a while. When was the last time it happened? Not sure. Months before my parents' accident. Since then, I've been completely well. well how did you get well? I was in a monastery. What? <laughs> my parents put me in a monastery. They asked the monks if they could, you know, heal me. <laughs> this is getting really bizarre, Matthew. It's right there. Half an hour by ferry from Cannes. You can see it from here. I often wondered if they ever remembered me and asked themselves if I was okay. And does that have something to do with the lost boy? It's got everything to do with the lost boy. I want to tell you the whole story, but uh, I'm not sure I want to. No boundaries. You sure? You said you think the boy's spoken to you. What could he have possibly said? I don't know. He said everything's already been revealed, I think. I don't get it. I don't either. I think it's something to do with his being lost. Maybe he's trying to tell me what really happened. That's so Stephen King. I know. Yet, I didn't feel spooked at all. I, I wanted to know. Did you, like, you know, speak to him? I think I tried, but I was kind of frozen. My words were coming out weird, like what happens during a nightmare when you want to do something but, but can't. So that's all he said, that everything's been revealed. One boy will be lost and another will be saved. What? That's what else I remember him saying. What does that mean? It's from one of my parents' films. It was a prediction some mystic in Normandy told Annette. Maybe it's your mind, Matthew. You know, that happens. Maybe it's you recalling your mother's film. You know what? I think you're right. Of course that's what it is. It just sounded so real, the, the voice. I mean, like it was whispering close to my ear. I'd like to see them. The other films? Yeah. There's a whole bunch of them. We have a whole bunch of time. Weeks later, Janya is in the kitchen brewing some tea. I hear the kettle whistle. It keeps on whistling for a long time, one long, insistent siren's note. And finally, I have to get up to see what's happening. She's standing by the kettle, watching the thin jet of st steam blowing out of the spout. In her hand are two bags of jasmine tea. On the tray beside the cups lies her plane ticket, torn in two. Uh, water's boiling. You've torn your ticket. She pulls the lid and drops, pu she pulls the lid out and drops the bags two at a time, absently, dropping the paper tags as well. She realizes her mistake, tries to scoop them out of, with a spoon and drops the spoon, clattering on the stove as a mushroom cloud of white hot steam scalds her hands. I hold her hand under the cold water tap. You okay? Let's solve this mystery once and for all. Let's go there. Where? There, where your parents lost the boy. On the plane in Manila, she tells me she has one more secret she can share only with me. Uh-oh, is this about your being a boy? I found your stepbrother. What? There's a guy in New York who claims to be some relation, something about your supposedly biological father. Is he like asking you to deposit some money in a Nigerian bank? <laughs> really, Janya? Well, assuming that the emails I've been getting are reliable, your real father apparently sowed some really wild oats in Manila, ran short of cash, as most hippies island hopping in Southeast Asia did in those days, got involved in some kind of local racket, and produced a nice clutch of sons to sell. Great. My dad was a bimbo. A surrogate father. A himbo, whatever. <laughs> and this guy from New York says he's one of the sons. Like uh, puppies in a puppy mill. Don't you ever want to know? No. It could tell you something about your condition. My condition? Your seizures. I mean, isn't that her hereditary or something? What would finding out do? I don't know, Matthew. I, maybe some research has already been done that could, you know, help. Yeah, like they can snip some nasty gene and I'd be as good as new. Okay. 
End of conversation. A stepbrother, for Christ's sake, in New York. My God, the epicenter of con artists. Is he in a Ponzi scheme or something? All right, already. I mean, really, Janya. Where did you find this wacko? In some message posted on some website. I was Googling you. Why? I was looking to see if there was anything, you know, some archive or something, about accidents involving tourists in San Cristostomo. It was an exercise in futility, of course. No news from that island ever went out until fairly recently. Okay, let me just warn you that A, there are thousands of scams lurking on the internet. And B, close to 75% of material you find there is unreliable. Not to forget C, there are probably thousands of other losers with the same freaking story. Just indulge me, okay? Indulge the investigative nosy in me. I told you the answer is in the films. Besides, it's been so long, we won't find anything there. This is nothing but a sentimental journey. We're doing this for you. Say thank you. Thank you. Think of it as a vacation. Janya has to spend a few days doing her work. She's a sweatshop monitor while urging Matthew to do some investigating in Manila. A local official, a small-time warlord with his own posse of slum-dwelling thugs, underpaid cops, and drug pushers, offers to take me around the city's low-income neighborhoods. But not even he really understands what I'm looking for. He thinks I'm looking to adopt a kid. Some families offer me their children. Sick children, starving children, kids worse off than dogs. And when I say I'm looking to adopt one, I, when I say I'm not looking to adopt one, they offer them just the same, saying in no uncertain terms that the kids are okay for me to fuck. $20, $50, and I can fuck any kid I want. Janya suggests that I go to City Hall and tell them I'm looking for my biological mother. 25 people show up. Everyone wants to claim me. Everyone has a document, a, a witness, a story to tell. Everyone will do anything to get out. I call Janya again. She's still somewhere north, wrapping up her latest, uh, last assignment before our flight. Any new clues? I give up. Oh, Matthew. Listen, I just realized something. If someone had screwed up, if Sylvain and Annette had not come to take me, I would have ended up as somebody else. I would have been one of these people, wretched as rats, still waiting for someone to save me. You okay? Yeah. No. Last night I had a dream. I was in some kind of time warp. I was trapped here like everyone else, helpless and doomed. And I hated him. I hated him so much I wanted to kill him. Who? My father, the guy who left me here. He should have just aborted me or something. But to leave me in a hellhole like this, that was real shit. FYI, abortion would have been out of the question. It's illegal here, always has been. This is paradise for the Christian right. Yeah, that fucker had no choice. He had to have me. Loser. You know what, though? Maybe Sylvain and Annette knew he was. A loser, I mean. Maybe, you know, they thought when I started getting, you know, defective, well, you know what? It's the loser gene showing up. They knew this was going to happen someday. Maybe that's why they just gave up on me. Damaged goods. Hello? Did you hear a word I said? I don't want to know. I don't want to know why he gave me up. I don't want to know what happened to him. Janya. Uh, Matthew, speak up. Oh, shit. Hey, hey Janya? Hey, he did me a favor by letting you live. Does that make you feel better? We're gonna... <laughs> now we're gonna switch gears. Um, this is an excerpt from the journal written by the father, Andrew Bretsky. Uh, he's being held in a provincial jail by someone called the lieutenant, who Lex will be portraying now, along with a student activist and a rapist named Eddie. The lieutenant sitting at his desk face to face with the student. It looks, out, it looks out of whack and surreal like they're just drinking and playing cards. Winged termites buzz around the bulb over their heads. They smash against the hot bulb and burn. 
Their wings, like small sheets of glass, flutter down and glisten on the surface of the desk. Now we're really going to have a good time. The student keeps his head down. He doesn't even look at me. The guy with the Uzi sits next to him and starts dealing the cards. The lieutenant fills a shot glass with rum. I don't think I want to offer you a drink. I didn't want one. The guy with the Uzi is dealing cards without looking up. He mumbles something in Tagalog. The lieutenant laughs, that weird laugh again like he's about to choke. He's wearing my t-shirt and jeans. He shows them off to me. What do you think? God bless America. They make the best jeans in the world. He pours the rum into the same glass. He passes it to the guy with the Uzi who downs the shot. Then the lieutenant refills the glass and hands it to me. I say no thanks. The lieutenant swipes the glass away. It hits the far end of the room. The guy with the Uzi stops dealing. Puta, puta. The guy with the Uzi tells him to cool it, snickering like he's enjoying it. He picks up the glass. He fills it and hands it to me. Okay, one shot, just to show you that we're okay. Are you going to write about me? No, I'm not. You going to write about this place? About the president? You're going to talk about uh, to foreign media? Get us in the news? No, it takes a lot more for something to become news. This isn't interesting? Is that it? I'm not interesting? I'm not a reporter, okay? I'm nobody. I'm not getting anybody in the news. That's not what I do. But you're always writing. Just for myself, just to remember. You want to remember this? No, not this. You don't want to remember it? You don't find it an interesting story? Not you, personally, but if I had a choice, I'd rather write it's about something less unpleasant. You talk like a writer. You learned to talk like that in school. Maybe you went to a nice school in America. You went to Berkeley, maybe? All the communists in America go to Berkeley, right? You see, I'm not dumb. I know a few things about America. And I didn't even go to school. I hate school. School is for sissies. You want a story, right? Something you can tell back home to your nice sissy friends? I can give you a story. Not really, no. I don't want anything right now. I just want to know why you're keeping me here. <coughs> Suddenly, he grabs me by the arm and pushes me out of the room. On instinct, the student makes a move to protect me. The guy with the Uzi shoves him back into the chair. He says, snidely and loud enough for me to hear, Don't piss him off. Your American friend will be okay. The lieutenant forces me out through another room and then another. I go through some kind of dreamlike warp and imagine this place is endless and I'm being forced through an infinite number of empty rooms. Finally, we reach a cell with no windows. There's a strong smell of dung. There's no light. In the shadows, there's someone lying on the bare cement floor. It's Eddie. He's been trussed up. His wrists and ankles bound behind him like a pig. He looks up and tries to say something. His lips are battered shut. One side of his face is grotesquely swollen. He didn't like to drink either. A classy bitch like you. What's he done to you, man? You can't do this. No. He kicks Eddie in the ribs. I hear something crack. Eddie groans and squirms in pain. I can do anything I want. This is my country. You and your friend, you talk a lot about Mao, about revolution, about drugs. Americans come here for the drugs, right? And the chicks? You like to fuck our chicks? You like our drugs? No, I don't. You don't like to fuck our chicks, you bakla? I don't like the drugs. We found a lot of drugs in your apartment. You know what that means? Is that what you're keeping me here for? You're a narc too? The lieutenant pulls a 45 from under his belt. Do narcs carry these? I don't know. I've never met any of you before. Narcs don't carry these. Do I look like a narc? No. But you said you never saw a narc before. No, I haven't. So how can you I say- I don't know. I really don't know. Don't cut me short. It makes me mad. Okay. Okay, what? Okay, man, I won't cut you short. I'm still mad. I'm still raving mad. He points the pistol at me, nudging the muzzle against my ribs. Ever shot a man before? No, I don't think I'd like to. I don't think I'd like to. You talk like a sissy. You a sissy? The guy who comes and visits you, he's a cocksucker, right? Your friend back there, the communist, he's a sissy too. Not that I know of. 400,000 pesos is a lot of money around here, you know that? That's a lot of money to steal. Is that what this is about? You want the money back? I don't care about the money. You Americans, you don't care. What is, what is it with you? In America, money grows on trees, no? Here, trees don't even grow shit. But we're okay. You think that's all we care about? You think we have no pride? You got us all wrong. He cocks the pistol and points it at me. 
Sa ikauunlad ng bayan, disiplinang kailangan. Nice, ha? Huh? I can be a poet too. You know what that means? So the country will prosper is we need some discipline. You like that? You like my English? Tell me what you want, man. Is it the money? Ever shot a man? No. He points the gun at Eddie. Don't blink. He fires a shot into Eddie's head. It bursts open like a fruit. Blood spurts and jets across the room. You think I like my job? There's a stench like sour milk inside the room. It's coming from Eddie. The lieutenant turns to face the wall, holding an arm against it to keep himself steady. Thick, sticky vomit spatters to his feet. He turns around to face me. His face is ashen like someone who's just come out of a long and terrible illness. I like it. I like it a whole fucking lot. He spits and staggers out of the room. I'm trying not to look at Eddie. I pull my t-shirt over my mouth and nose. I'm watching a black streak oozing out from under the body. It's inching its way to me, just one thin greasy line. It creeps forward, then pauses, then crawls forward again. It seems like a thing alive in itself, coming closer and closer to the edge of my feet, driven by a need to make contact with anything. Even when the door opens and the guy with the Uzi tells me to get going, I'm still watching it. I can't make my body move. I'd like to introduce you to this amazing cast, Jennifer. Jennifer Betit Yen. Ben Mandel. Alexis Camins. Thank you, guys. I think we're doing a scene change here, and then Jessica and I will be chatting with you guys. Well, I'm just, <laughs> that blew me away, literally. <laughs> um, Eric, you're so violent. Such a gentleman, but he can write those vivid, scary scenes. I have a dark side. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> OK. Um, on that note, no, congratulations, because I think it's amazing. You know, he's, you've been writing for so long in the Philippines, when I first met you, I remember, and this was around, was it 1990 or 91? It was the elections were right, about right. to happen. Right. And I was sent there to cover the elections. And um, it was a huge deal because um, for the first time, people were going to be voting again. Right. Right? After mm -hmm. the long, long martial law period and then the period when Corey came in and she was running the country. Um, but they decided to hold these elections and it was a very, um, uh, a major moment it felt like in the country. So I met you as a journalist. Mm -hmm. You were a young journalist and you were working with Sheila Coronel. I was, right. And what was the name of the group? It, uh, it was called the uh, Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. Right. and. Um, we all went to lunch and talked about what was about to transpire because I had to sort of coming from New York and go there and go back and, and I got the lay of the land a little bit from you and Sheila. Right. And was this the uh, election where Fidel Ramos was? Running? It was Fidel Ramos, it okay. was Joseph Estrada, it was Miriam Santiago. Defensor, yeah. She was truly Crazy fun. Right. <laughs> she was one of my favorite interviews. <laughs> I felt like, am I dreaming? Um, and 
a strap. There were four of them. Did I say them all? Oh, uh, Kawanko. Right, right. It's been, I can't even yes. remember. Yes, and who was a very <laughs> scary man um, and who refused to talk to me. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting thing. But I remember you because, so vividly, because, you know, um, we talked about your novels. And you are someone who is a poet. You write short stories. Um, this book, which is an important book, is the first book published by an American publisher, a fiction by mm -hmm. Eric. But he's an accomplished writer from the Philippines. And I just want to talk to you about a little bit about what it feels like, this sort of long journey. And you've been living here quite a few years. 20 years. And you also <laughs> make films. And I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're an artist of many mediums. And this book, in a, in a funny sort of way, brings a lot of your passions and work together, I feel, um, your love of film especially, right, and right. how you use all those connections. I mean, I'm, I was sort of really enthralled by that. So I, I just kind of want to, my, my first question to you is, how do you feel about um, being this writer today? and having all these influences um, coming from being the disciplined journalist, working with a group that was against the government and you know, really um, doing work that was extremely risky and when you were living there, mm -hmm. and then coming to the US and becoming the writer you are today. I mean, what, how do you feel that this is all sort of affected the writing of this book, because it took you a long time to write this. You it, it say, did. I it was... have your statement. Oh, and you do? Of okay. course, it it's important. It took me 10 years to, to write yes. the book. Yes, but you didn't write, I mean, you stopped and started. Right, and right, it. and gave up on it several times, and then went back, or it came back to me, mm -hmm. you know, so. But, but yeah, to answer your question, my, I think my being a former journalist in Manila informs a lot about what, what I am today, I mean, you know, um, as a as a young journalist in Manila, you got to uh, you get to see a lot of things that were forbidden from the general public, and that's basically the reason why I did want to be a journalist against my parents' wishes. They wanted me to be a doctor, of course, you know. So, <laughs> um, but it was the only way I could find out exactly what was going on. I did. I didn't know. You know, I was I was in high school when Marcos declared martial law and. And, um, and I didn't know what was going on, um, and I couldn't know what was going on, but journalism kind of opened that for me. You know, there was, we used to say, as long as you have a press pass, you could enter anywhere, right? You mm -hmm. could go anywhere. And, and that, that's, that's how I learned about what was actually going on back then. But did you always have the passion for writing and journalism was one way in which you were exploring that writing or did the creative, you know, I hate all these little sort <laughs> of categories, but we kind of have to separate them sometimes in conversation. Mm -hmm. But did you feel like then becoming a poet and, a, and you're a playwright too. So uh -huh. it's, it's like that came after the journalism kind of opened you up as a writer, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, I think it, it, I think it just all happened simultaneously. What I, what I felt was my journalism was actually feeding my, my creative side, because mm. I, was, I was finding a lot of stories that, that I felt would be better served as either fiction or poetry. Uh, also, back then, you know, there was, there was censorship. And uh, one of the things we did back then was instead of saying things outright, you kind of coached your, couched your whatever you wanted to say in, in fiction or poetry, especially poetry. Uh, for some reason, the government didn't care much about poets unless they were like, you but know. But they killed a real. few. Right, right, because, <laughs> because they were actively right. part of the, the communist movement. Yeah. But if you were just a poet, they, you know, they didn't understand what you were doing. They left you alone. So it was kind of like a safe way to write what you really wanted to say, you know, mm -hmm. without offending the powers that be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, 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 but journalism was, it, it, I think it provided a, a rich source of material for me. 
Oh, I'm sure. And well, some of these scenes that we heard today, well, particularly good old Lieutenant, <laughs> um, uh, and um, the scene in the jail are so um, detailed and tense. And I'm wondering if you used things you knew from the past, um, how people were treated. I mean, you were sort of privy to that information. Right, right. Um, to create a scene like that's really beautifully rendered and terribly scary. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's right, really right. gorgeous, um, but very scary. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I I used some of my experience. I wasn't I wasn't exactly in jail, although I I was briefly once uh, for a night for something really stupid. I was, uh, you know, I was a young journalist writing for a rock magazine, and we went to this concert. We smoked before the concert, of course, and then I had a stick of marijuana in my pocket, and I got searched, and I got, you know, hauled to a military jail overnight, but that's where I saw what was going on. It was, it was horrific, you know, it was... Uh, and you could hear it, too. I yeah, and I could see them beating up some young guys, but fortunately, my, my brother-in-law back then worked for the government press, so somebody called him, one of my friends called him and he got me out like, you know, at the crack of dawn or something. But it was, it was terrifying. But um, some of the, uh, the lines from that scene actually, I, I actually experienced not in a jail, but uh, my friends and I were on a, some kind of local train. And uh, for some reason, there was a bunch of military guys there who were drinking. And for some reason, they wanted to play with me. They, they, you know, and then, you know, some of them, they were, they were telling me to drink up, and I was like, no, I don't want to drink. And they were getting angry, but you have to drink, you know, <laughs> you know, and so I used some of that in, mm -hmm. in that scene, but, mm -hmm. and I knew they were, they were cops, you know, they, one of them actually showed me, you know what this is, this is a gun, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> I could see that, um, but I got out of that as well, you know. <laughs> So. Well, we're really glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you were recently back in the Philippines for the big festival. pre-launch, right, yeah. right. And tell us about that experience, because it's been a while since you've been back there as the writer you are. Mm -hmm. um, and how was that experience for you with this new book coming? It was, it was amazing. It's uh, one of the things I've been telling people is that I keep forgetting how polite people are in the Philippines and so nice you know it's so not New York you know um, but it was also I think it was a good ex a, a good opportunity for me to meet a lot of young people who had been friending me on Facebook I actually got to meet them face to face so I think that's that's really nice it's a uh, I think it's great that the young people in the Philippines are still reading our works yeah. you know when I when I was growing up in when I was a young writer in the Philippines somebody said we were the last we were going to be the last generation to write in English English was dying out people would start writing in Filipino and then our generation would be completely forgotten um, but it hasn't happened in fact both languages are now seeing some kind of uh, an upsurge in readership which is really good and the proud thing to say here is that um, Manila Noir, which is the anthology that Eric's wonderful, scary story, <laughs> oh my God, this guy writes this stuff. <laughs> You're really good at it, too. So um, uh, just got the Philippine yeah. National Book Award for Best Anthology. Yay. So we're really like, I'm, I'm, I was so moved by that. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm hoping that you know, maybe the, this book, I mean, of course it's going to be available there, but I wonder if you'd be open to doing, you know, a Philippine edition that everybody can afford more easily. Right. I know. think, I think, um, I think Akashic was able to do a distribution deal that Good. people find it's, affordable. Yeah. Uh, my, my siblings actually bought copies, so that's a good sign. <laughs> good. So here are some things you say, and I, I, I do want to, you know, not take up the entire conversation, because I'm sure there are people here who have things they'd like to talk with you about. Um, but you say here in your author statement, which I found really helpful, um, that your novel, this new novel, began with a feeling or a whirlwind of feelings. 
Um, unlike your previous novels, which began with a plot or an idea for a plot. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting because most of my novels, believe it or not, <laughs> begin as feelings too. Oh, I, 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 I'm not plot driven at all, um, or a character. Uh -huh. um, and your characters are so vivid, you know. Um, I mean, and the lieutenant is very memorable to me because he's unpredictable. But he also <laughs> says some amazingly profound things. Um, and it was 2002, so you have this thing about 9-11 and... Right, right. Yeah, the connection. But here's what's interesting to me is the specter of martial law hanging throughout this book. You know, it's like it's there and it's got its repercussions and karmic consequences, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so would you say in a way that one of the themes of this novel is the karmic consequence? You know, the, the brothers, um, right, right. Janya, and what happens, and I yeah. don't want to, like, spoil it. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to explore karmic consequences, the consequences of uh, social political systems, you know, what happened during Marcus's martial law uh, and what it did to a lot of people who are still living today, um, what it did to me. Um, and I also wanted to explore the karmic consequences of personal decisions. So the father, the young father, actually made a lot of decisions that he thought were good at that time. But then you jump forward to the story of the two guys, um, and, and they're, they're messed up, and they kind of blame their father for, for that. Um, but, but I was, uh, you know, I, I think it's some years ago, a bunch of my friends and I were talking about writing about martial law, and, and one of them actually said, isn't it about time that we stop writing about Marcus and martial law and move on and write about other things? And at that time, I kind of agreed. I thought, yeah, let's, you know, let's, there must be other stories. But then you realize what's going on in the Philippines right now, the Marcuses are back. Uh, Inelda's still there, her children, her son wants to be president, which is, and he'll, abs probably, be and he'll probably win. It's mm. so absurd, and their cronies are still there. The, the guys who stole our national economy are still there. And it, it just never stops. And I was one of the things I told the, uh, the young people that I met in Manila last month is that it's crazy that all the things that we fought against uh, back in the 70s and 80s, they're still talking about. They're still, they're still going through the same old things. And it's, it's just this whole loop you know, that, that doesn't seem to end. Mm -hmm. So if that doesn't end, then I think our uh, telling and retelling of the Marcus years is probably not going to end as well. Yeah. Yes, and I feel that um, your book really sort of opens this up for us again as a conversation and in a, in a really interesting way and surprising way. Um, there, I'm going to alliterate some of the things that are in it, and I think it's birth and death, you know. Um, you have abortion, you have um, amnesia, and what was the other one? Adoption. Adoption. <laughs> and really you explore, you know, the repercussions of all that. Um, but I, I wanted to tell you, um, one of the things I was thinking about this morning as I was reading uh, your book, I was thinking about the Chilean filmmaker Patricio Guzman, mm -hmm. who um, you know, I mentioned to you and you, you wanna, you're interested in seeing his work, and I hope you do. His whole um, body of work has been about the Chilean you know, sort of consciousness, um, what happened at when their country, you know, went under the regime of the military in 1972. And I think it was in September as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I almost feel like all these things happened at the same time in different parts of the world. And I find that very spooky, mm -hmm. right? And he was there, uh, still living there, and he filmed when the palace was bombed and when Allende was killed. And, and, you know, for that, a lot of his crew was captured and tortured and killed. And he managed to get out 
and lived in exile in, in France for many, many years, and has just gone back to Chile, hmm. you know, now that it's kind of okay. But he talks about, and he made a film called, which made me think of this book, called Obstinate Memory, about people who want to forget, mm -hmm. you know, and then those who can never forget. And he filmed these college students who had never heard about the massacres or even, you know, had a very distant feeling about it. Right, and right. and um, were saying things like, well, why do we have to keep talking about this, right, you know? Right. Um, so um, I, you know, you have a lot of film references here. And uh, I just feel like that might be something you want to look at because he's completely possessed. Right, and right. that is his work, his life's work. And I feel like, in a way, this is your life's work. I think um, if, if the uh, late Filipino filmmaker, Lino Broca, had lived, uh, he, was, he was one of the uh, most amazing filmmakers back then, but he died in a car accident at the age of 50. Mm -hmm. I think if he had lived, he would be doing that sort of thing. He would be one of those people who would refuse to forget what had happened um, during martial law. I met him back then, you know, when 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 I was a journalist, and he was actually. Uh, I have a story about the EDSA revolution. I actually was trying, you know, I was covering the uh, one of the events that was happening. I don't know if you guys know about that, the Yellow Revolution in the Philippines, when um, um, the military turned against Marcos and decided to support Corazon Aquino. So I was I was working for a magazine back then, and my editor told me to cover. Um, apparently, we heard that troops from the south were being flown in to take over uh, Channel 4, the government station. Um, and, um, and my editor told me to go there and check it out. And, you know, they were, yeah, as soon as the, the troops landed, they started shooting. All the, the one faction of the soldiers and the other faction started shooting. And I was, I was on the ground, you know, like everybody else. And then suddenly, this, this, uh, Cheap passes by, and it's Lino Broca, and I had interviewed him a week before, and he was calling me like, Eric, come here, come here, you're just gonna kill yourself. <laughs> so for the rest of that day, I was, I was with him on his Jeep, and that was the day that the Marcuses left, actually. Um, but I remember speaking to him after that, and he was very upset that Corazon Aquino was, was saying, we should forgive and forget, forgive all the sins of the Marcus people and let's start all over again. And he was just so mad at that. He said, we should never forgive, we should never forget. You know? <laughs> um, and you know, he was, uh, he, he became part of the, uh, the Constitutional Convention, but he walked out because he was, you know, he just felt that everything was the same, uh, you know, and um, mm -hmm. he just felt that that wasn't the right way to uh, to change what was going on in the Philippines. But he would have been somebody like that. Like you know? that, yeah, yeah, obstinate memory. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'm so happy for you. This is so great. <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, I'm very moved by this, and I'm, uh, I think it's a beautiful, I love this cover. Oh, thank you. Um, how did you, my last question before we turn it over, and I hope I'm not eating up all the time, the title. Can you talk to us a little bit about it? I mean, I, I know you're right, here, right. but um, do you want to? I mean, or do you want your readers to, to uh, discover it through this book? I, I think you will, but you know, it's uh, the Descartes Highlands is the region of the moon where the Apollo 16 landed in 1972, just before Marcus declared martial law. So I wanted to juxtapose, oh, right, I wanted to juxtapose that and you know, the. Uh, the father keeps talking about the Descartes Highlands and how um, you can see, you can actually see the the, uh, the tracks of the moon rover um, uh, from a telescope from Earth, and uh, apparently those tracks are going to remain there because there are no winds on the moon, so they're never going to be uh, erased. So, so I thought it would be a an interesting juxtaposition between that image and the year that. Marcus declared martial law in the year that this whole mess began, you know, his, uh, whatever he went through and how that reverberates to the present time. Mm. No, I love the way your mind takes those leaps. Um, 
let's see, uh, if I've forgotten anything. Oh, you have this thing called referential mania. Nabokov. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> then let's bring on the faith healers. <laughs> I mean, uh, whatever you're looking for, it's in this book. So um, I'm going to open it up to the audience and see if anyone has any questions or comments for you. Anyone? Ah, you choose. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, the, the, yeah. There's lots you, on this side. Yeah. <laughs> With the glasses. They all have glasses. <laughs> oh, right. Jan? And also Jan. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Is it on? We can hear you. You can hear me? Oh. There are people watching online. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Edward Snowden. <laughs> Citizen oh, no. Four. Hello. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Ms. Hagedorn and Mr. Gamalinda. Good um, evening. I just wanted to ask because actually the excerpts that we listened to was reminiscent of Ms. Hagedorn's novel, Dog Eaters, for me. And I was just curious, and either of you can answer this, the fact that you both had this commonality of having a feeling to start the novel, and I, I hope you had that as well for Dog Eaters, mm -hmm and how you had um, martial law as the backdrop. And uh, Ms. Hagedorn said that you did a beautiful rendering of the violence, but it actually was reminiscent for me of Daisy Avila being um, tortured by General Ledesma and his goons in her novel. So I was just curious why, with her writing it in the 90s, you revisiting it now, um, why you made martial law such a focal point, and also why there's this violence in both of your novels. Thank We're you. We're just violence junkies. You want to go first? No, I think you should answer. <laughs> and then I'll add, you know, I'll add my thoughts, but right. I think this is for you to you, you know, one of, my, one of my favorite filmmakers is Michael Haneke, and he, he said that somebody asked him why there was so much violence in his films, and he said that he wanted, uh, he, he wanted uh, to make a statement about the use of violence in Hollywood films, violence as entertainment. He said violence is, should not be entertainment, violence should be repulsive. And uh, you know, some of his films are hard to look at, and he said that's what violence should do to you. You should, you should look away, you know, and you should not like it. Um, and, and you know, I, I kept that in mind when I was writing the violent scenes. I knew that it would be hard to read. It was certainly hard to write, you know. But, but I wanted the same, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking along the same line that that's what violence should, that's the, that's the feeling that violence should incite in us. Well, and to answer your question of why we might both be doing this, um, because I'm not the only person who should be writing about it. I uh, certainly not, and certainly Eric lived through those times, and he was there and saw things I've never seen. You know, I've seen it in other ways, and I've interviewed people about it, um, and things have happened to people I know. Um, but each of us looks at it quite differently, and also Eric is looking at it from a lens of now, and he's telling quite a different story. You know, and I think that we're the same generation. Um, and it's, I, I was saying to Eric earlier, you're haunted. You know, I'm haunted. You know, we're all haunted by different things, right? But this is why I brought up Guzman's film, films about Chile. It's kind of like he's t saying, he's exploring the same themes, but in different ways over and over. And every time it's something surprising and powerful. Mm -hmm. it's, it, you can know you can never know it. And um, why is it violent? Because that stuff is violent and it's ugly. And people do these things to each other and to dogs and to, you know, I mean, you wrote that one scene. It was really right. tough and you do it early in the book, you know. And, and I think I'm also thinking of, um, 
the Jamaican novelist Marlon James, who has a new book out. Um, everybody's saying to him, why is it so violent? Why is it? And he's like, because I'm writing about a time in my country that was really ugly, and I'm not going to make it pretty. And I hope you understand that when I say it was beautifully rendered, I don't mean that he made it pretty. I mean, he's just a really exquisite writer, and he did it with enough, you know, um, he knew what notes to play, you know, and I appreciate that as a writer. I mean, I have to give him his props, right? But, you know, you can write it too. I mean, I'm saying we all need to write those stories, right? If those are the stories we want to write and we want to keep writing them, we write them in different ways. And Eric has things to say about that time and um, that I could never say, you know. Um, but I think maybe that's why I'm sitting here in conversation. <laughs> with him too is because we're exploring some of the same um, themes perhaps, but we're really different people. And I'm a movie junkie too, but different, you know, different. And I was going to say to you, who are you reading now? Um, I'm reading a lot of nonfiction. Like uh, who? Um, well, uh, I love asking this. Yeah, I, I, I haven't given up on Piketty's capital in the 21st century yet. What? Y yeah, I mean, I, I. Oh, that guy. Yeah, that that big book. The French guy. Yeah, I was I was one of those crazy people who got the first edition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but it's it's interesting because uh, I've been reading a lot about economics. I'm I'm just curious about why we here in the U.S. are in the mess we're in, and you know, you read a lot of theory. You read Stiglitz and and these other guys, but but. Piketty is the first one who actually shows you the data, right? This is why we're all messed up because this is what's happening. Um, it's hard to read. I'm only on chapter in chapter four, but but I haven't given up. And you've been up. reading it for how long? Since since it came out. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah, I was almost gonna buy it, and I thought you're never gonna get through that. Yeah. Never. You, you have to. You know, I, I read two pages and then I get a headache. Yeah. yeah. You know. So, <laughs> uh, but but it's it's. You know, it's it's uh, it, nobody's ever done it before, so it's very interesting. Last night, I downloaded something called uh, "Racism Without Racists" by Eduardo Bonilla Silva. Very interesting. Uh, it's about um, what he calls uh, colorblind racism, which is what he said we're experiencing today. Which you know, I've only read the first chapter last night, but it's it's a very interesting book, I think, and I think I can. In Use it. Class. Right, right, yeah. in class. Yeah. yeah. And Jan, you had a question? Yes. Um, Don't you I, feel like you're in a karaoke club? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had very much experience <laughs> there. But I'll follow you around, Jessica. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, the, the visual art I love to look at always invites, or to buy or to own, always invites me back to look at it again and again and again. And I love to read. And I barely have enough time. And this is such a rare experience reading this book. From the beginning, I said, I want to come back and read it again. Because there are so many layers. There are so many geographies and sexualities and eras. And, and I just wonder where that incredible complexity in your writing comes from. And if it has to do something with colonization, with, I, I don't I, it, it just was amazing. I felt very truthful complexity. Um, colonization, yes, right? I mean, it's, a, it's a, I think coming from a, a colonized culture does give you a lot of layers in your identity, and, right? And hybrid and culture, And in your, too. right, and also in, in your own narrative and in the way you present narrative. I've always, I've always wanted to write a simple story, but I can't. I seem to not be able to do that. Every time I have a simple plot, a hundred things come in, and I have to actually, you know, push them out so that that the, 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 all the details don't intrude into the story. But but yeah, a lot of colonial literature is many layered, right? Mm -hmm. Except for Scarmetta, but then also he's also very layered, but. Uh, so I, but I, he's post-colonial. <laughs> post-colonial, <laughs> right, right. I mean, you're a post-colonial, darling. So, <laughs> okay. uh, but I think that's even more layers than colonial. Because uh -huh. you're 
openly dealing with a lot of things that colonials could not deal with. Right, so, right. Um, yeah. Plus, I think that's just who you are. You're very complex. He's, he's like brilliant, this guy. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's your curiosity and your imagination, but also your post-colonial self exploring all these things and you've traveled, you know, so I feel like in your interest in film, I mean, you found, you found a ve vehicle to kind of, um, and a storyline right, right. that can sort of uh, right. absorb all these right. passions of yours that have been going on all his life. And, and I do in like using film technique in, in prose. I think it, uh, film technique works very well. Um, and I use that a lot. Going in, back, yeah. Right. In fact, I actually uh, crib a few scenes from films that I like in the book, you know. So, um, if, you know, you might recognize some of them. But, but I do like, you know, like I think the jump cut jump cut works very well in fiction. Um, I think the, uh, the zoom in works very well, mm -hmm. you know. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of these, you know, tricks actually are very useful in fiction. Anyone else? There are a lot of writers here I know. Who have possible? There was somebody who... Ah, hey, hey Mike. Hey. Hey, hello, Eric. Hey. Um, I was wondering, uh, your book was nominated, or I think it was shortlisted for the 2009 was it Asian Man yeah, Literary Prize, I think. Uh -huh. I was wondering how much it changed from then and now. Oh, a lot. A lot. Um, the, uh, the manuscript that I sent to the prize was, uh, uh, the, the, it was uh, the stories came one after the other. They were like, I think the way I described it to the uh, to, you know, when I submitted my, my entry was, it's three novellas in, in one book. Um, but at some point after my agent and I started talking to a bunch of publishers and editors, somebody suggested that I chop it up into um, kind of like, you know, alternating episodes. And um, at first I didn't want to do that. I thought that would be very confusing for the reader. Uh, but she, she was very convincing, so she told me to just try it and see if it works. And, and once I started doing that, I actually, uh, for the first time, enjoyed writing the book. You know, it was a very difficult book to write, but chopping it up like that was very enjoyable and making sure that, you know, because it became a jigsaw puzzle, making sure that the pieces fit was actually a fun thing to do. And cinematic. And cinematic, yeah, right. Yeah. I think this thing is okay. It's on. Um, do you, your books have been published in the Philippines, um, like My Sad Republic, and what was the title? For Empire of Memory. Empire of Memory. I think. Right, right. Have you uh, have you ever thought about like revisiting those books or trying to get them published in the United States? Uh, I hope so. I've actually Empire of Memory got reissued um, last October when I was in time for my visit there, and what I did was. Um, I, I completely rewrote the book. Um, this was something that <laughs> I and my, yeah, it was something that I and my, my publisher there had been talking about for years now. Um, and when she said that she was releasing it for, my, for, my, for the launch of the Descartes Highlands in Manila, I, uh, I said, well, let me give you the new version. Um, so so I, I like it much better now. It's, uh, I cleaned up the language, I tightened the story a bit. I got rid of some characters that I thought were just superfluous. Um, and and um, one of the writers that I saw there actually told me, so how do you feel about it now? And I, I told him, I'm no longer ashamed of it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> to re oh, that's great to be able to do that, revisit right, right. A, a book. And, and, and rewrite it. And rewrite it, knowing <laughs> what you know now. Right, right. So wonderful. Yeah. And hopefully it gets published here at some point. Who knows? <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, yes. And then over there. Okay. There are these um, three strands, you know, the father and the, the two boys. And it's um, very interesting in the book to see how these lives come together. And in, in some way it's cinematic, and yet there's something about the fiction form that, that makes them feel at once 
perhaps that one is in the past, but, but actually makes it feel like they're happening at the same time. And I'm just wondering if, if that was a conscious decision. Uh, it's how I experienced it. I don't know if anyone else had that experience. Yeah, I, but I it was, did too. Yeah. It, it was, it's kind of a haunting uh, experience because this idea of, of a collapsed history and who this person is and his decisions you know, get interwoven in these very interesting ways. So I just wondered if right, you right. could say something about that. I, I, I did want to create that kind of effect. Uh, I, I, was, I was worried at first that it might make the, the whole novel a little confusing, but I wanted the, the presence of the father to be there all the time, um, uh, not visible to the characters in the beginning, but at some point when they start discovering uh, fragments of his journal, then then his presence becomes uh, even more looming. But I wanted him, I wanted the presence to be there constantly throughout the book because because it is it is a kind of haunting, as you say, right? Uh, and and I think in the beginning, um, um, the the haunting isn't there yet. You just know that there's this third story. Um, and, and you wonder how that's going to connect with the two characters, but hopefully at some point in the middle you realize that all the three stories are actually connected. The young lady. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if this is a fair question to ask, but I guess as a reader you rarely have the chance to ask this of the, the author. Uh, before reading the text. Um, so you said in the artist statement, it, you mentioned referential mania, or, um, and I guess what kind of work do you ask your reader to do in terms of that? So thinking about Nabokov and you know maybe Pale Fire or something, um, where you're kind of having this manic moment as a reader and encountering the text in that way. I don't know if that made any sense or if that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> But what um, kind of work would you say the reader has to do before actually even encountering the text? Oh, uh, hopefully not much. Although I think I think the reader's experience will be richer if if he knew what I was referring to. Um, and hopefully I'm not making things obscure in the book or any references obscure because I think I kind of explain or the characters kind of explain why they mention refer referential mania or yeah. something like that. But, but I do think that um, uh, I think somebody who's, who's read Nabokov or Dostoevsky would have a richer experience when, when the characters start talking about these authors you know, or, or the filmmakers. But it's but, pretty um, much, you, you say it in context, it's one of the characters feels like he's having a moment of that. Right, right. right? And because we, as the reader, you're um, uh, seeing exactly, he, he has it right before he says it to us. You know, he has a moment just like, so you know what he's talking about. For example, I didn't know that, you know, this is something from Nabokov, you know, mm -hmm. but I mean, I got it. So you'll be fine. I mean, especially because you know Pale Fire. I mean, right, right. great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's very accessible. And you do make it quite, it's beautifully simple. That's why I like Thank the you. writing. It's not, and, you know, and the characters obscure. warn you before they drop names. Like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop gonna about Dostoevsky now. And but this you'll French be okay. filmmaker. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it's fun, so it's not off-putting or, oh, my God, I have to know all this stuff. You know, it's kind of like, I discovered that. You know, it's like, oh, that's what I have. Oh, <laughs> never knew. <laughs> Anyone else? Ah, Christine. First of all, thank you. Um, Eric, I want to start uh, a writerly question and then a musical question. Um, in terms of, you talked about it took 10 years to write this book. Could you maybe talk about... Um, what kept you going <laughs> during that time? What what made you feel that this is the story that, a story, a book that needed to be in the world? How does it feel now that it's it's here? How do you feel about it? And then the musical question: What was that concert that you missed because you had to go to prison? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was the New Moon concert. Um, you know they they have it every year, but 
Yeah, and I heard it was a really great concert. <laughs> um, the, 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 I, I kind of gave up on the book so many times. I think I was kind of like, you know, trying to abort it. I was the abortionist in this. <laughs> yeah. And um, there, there were, it, first of all, it was, the, the characters were so hard to get into. And, and when I write characters, I usually try to, you know, inhabit the characters. And they were just, you know, they're so messed up. And it was hard to uh, just try to see the world through their eyes. So that was one of the reasons why, for several times, I thought of giving up the book. So I, I stopped doing it after, you know, writing up couple of versions, I would just lay it aside and I, I would tell myself, well, that's it, this thing is dead. But it just kept coming back though. Uh, and then I'd revise it again, and then I'd tell myself, okay, this sucks, you know, this, I'm just gonna throw it. Um, then it'd come back again. Uh, so finally, when, when I heard about the Man Asian Prize, I thought, well, this might be a good way to see if it's worth anything, you know. Um, and, and when it became a finalist, I reread the whole thing. I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe it is kind of okay. <laughs> so, um, and I think that's how you know it. Everything happened after that. You know, I got to uh, m my agent called me, and you know, this, this guy called me and said he wanted to represent me. And then um, uh, we we started working on it again. And then and then he found um, um, Akashic, who's here, by the way. It's probably a good time to say thank you to Akashic coolest publisher on the planet. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's, that's how it just, you know, it just refused to die. <laughs> it's hard to write about such, like you say, unhappy people. Yeah. Because you, we become our characters. We're channeling them. We're speaking for them. And, you know, when you live in that world for so long, you know, it can be really difficult. So it's really great that you submitted it and sort of got, wait, you know, yeah. some affirmation or something that yeah. it was worth all that pain. Yeah, when I, when I was a kid, um, our family doctor actually told me to stop writing because I was writing such depressing things. And it was make, <laughs> he said, your, your writing is making you sick, you know, because I was very sickly when I was, you know, uh, but I didn't listen to his advice. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you go. I just had one Great. thing about, um, because, you know, you, I mean, I read it, I remember reading it a while ago when there was, of course, the Italian was in it, um, the Italian brother. And um, so I, um, I'm just thinking about the way this novel, or, or if you could talk about the way um, along with Jessica's work and um, I, I think with Jessica's work and your work, the way you're expanding the, the subjects for the Philippine novel or for, for the novel, let's say, let's not, not, let's say it's not Philippine novel, but the novel of where you want to talk about the place that you're from, but you, also, but you have also all these different interests, obviously, and you keep how sometimes a novel, novelist like you might be asked to, you know, just fit the box of the Filipino. Um, and what I was so excited about with this novel was that it's really big. I mean, it, it's the, the, the boundaries are huge. Mm -hmm. And to think about the fact that the early novels, the early novels in English by Filipinos were also very big. I mean, the novel by Juan Laya, his native soil, the novel by, um, even the, the Filipino Rebel by, Maxi, by Maximo Calao, huge novels. I mean, they're, they're all over the place. You know, Filipino Rebel is in, is in Spain, Hong Kong, America, um, the Philippines. But sometimes it seems you're being asked to just do the identity novel or whatever it is that you're being asked to do by the publisher. And so I thought it was so cool that it was so big. You're back to the old Filipino novel, which was actually quite... Um, Expensive. Quite international. Yeah. Uh, so, I, uh, or um, what problems did you, did you have with that? Did you have problems with that as a writer that, um, that your novel uh, was not seemingly typical? Um, I mean, it wasn't, it didn't have a fruit in the title, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, I thought about it for, for, for many years, actually, when, when I first came here, because that was, you know, there was, a, there was a type of novel that was expected of you as an Asian American writer, right? Um, and and for, for years, I actually considered writing something along that line, you know, just so I could sell a book. But, uh, but, but I also realized that a lot of the Asian American writers from, from many years before have already laid the groundwork. Uh, you know, um, Asian American fiction actually began, according to Elaine Kim, uh, when, when um, diplomats, Asian diplomats, started writing books as a way to introduce their culture to America. And they were, they were mostly books that tried to portray Asians as, as decent, normal, uh, people, right? They're not. They're not the uh, the kind of people that that they were are. depicted back then, <laughs> right? Right. Uh, so it was it was kind of uh, right, right. Um, and I think Asian American fiction stems from that kind of thinking of trying to introduce ourselves to the American public, um, and and trying to introduce ourselves as normal people, just like everybody else. Um, and I think a lot of the uh, Earlier writers had done an excellent job of doing that, of laying the groundwork for people like us. And I think now it's a good time to start writing beyond beyond the norm. You know, um, I, I think if anybody still wants to understand what the cultural historical background is, say about the Philippines, they can read a lot of they can read Bulosan, um, they can read other people who've done the work for us, right? So, so I think it's a good time to, to be expansive and to write whatever we want to write. Well said. I think we're out of time. We're good? We're good. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, writers. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add to that because I think this idea of being a, of a big and complex story that is at once um, grounded in some ways within Filipino culture. And uh, I just appreciate that you brought up Chile because it feels like it's of a, uh, of a post, it's, I don't know if there's what the term is, but it's post-specific in a way. There, there's some piece of this story that, that, is, um, that, is, that is pinpointing something that I, I don't know that I've ever really experienced in the same way in, in literature. You know, it's without hitting you over the head in, in some way. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, coming out of the, the uh, Vietnam War generation and, mm -hmm. and all of that where so many things were didactic in a particular way or, or kind of obvious. And there's something that's very, what's so haunting about your novel is that it doesn't ever let you uh, you know, just feel some relief, like, okay, I, now I get it. That's, that's what um, has stayed with me. Like, these characters have stayed with me. And we're talking about it tonight. I mean, I read it, what, two months ago, and it's like I realized, oh, wow, this really did have a big impact. So I just, you know, my hat's off to, to you, and it was, uh, you know, this was a great conversation, and I think um, I'm really delighted that there are so many people who are involved with creative writing in various ways and, and bringing, bringing new kinds of stories to the fore and, and kind of getting out of some of the, the silos that have been out there. Anyway, join me, join us in the back, but, but a big hand for both, both Jessica and Eric. Thank you.